In the quiet town of Plano, Texas, a horrifying incident took place that would leave the community shattered. Dana Schlosser, a seemingly ordinary mother, committed an act so heinous that it would be remembered for years to come. On November 22, 2004, Dina took a butcher knife and amputated the arms of her 11-month-old daughter, Margaret. She claimed that the apocalypse was coming and God told her that he needed to be with them. Could this have been prevented? What does religion have to do with her sacrifice? In today's story, we will see how Dana's mental illness was ignored and a cult rather than religion decided the fate of little Margaret. Born in 1969, Dana's life was marked by challenges from the start. At just eight years old, she was diagnosed with hydrocephalus, a condition where fluid accumulates in the brain, causing intense pressure, headaches, and even mental impairment. By her teenage years, Dina had already undergone eight surgeries, targeting her brain, heart, and abdomen. Despite her challenges, Dina's spirit remained unbroken. In college, she met John. While she pursued and achieved a bachelor's in psychology, John's academic journey was less straightforward, often missing classes and eventually dropping out. Post-college, the duo tied the knot, welcoming two daughters into their world. Dina embraced motherhood, staying home with the girls, while John ventured into the computer science realm. However, their lives took a dark turn when they stumbled upon the Water of Life Church, led by the enigmatic Doyle Davidson. Davidson, a former vet turned self-proclaimed prophet, was less a pastor and more a cult leader. He claimed direct communication with God and had a slew of controversial beliefs. To understand Davidson's dangerous influence, consider this. He once asserted that a Columbine victim's fate could have been different if she just had more faith. Davidson's obsession with the Jezebel spirit, which he believed plowed Plano, further showcased his distorted teachings. He propagated that this spirit lured men through women into sinful acts. Dina and John, initially from Fort Worth, were so entranced by Davidson that they relocated to Plano, driving 60 miles each way for his sermons. John believed in Davidson's teachings so completely that he once told his visiting in-laws that he was the head of the household and he owned his wife and kids. But as John's career stumbled, financial woes struck. Amidst foreclosures and unemployment, Dana, previously not religious, became deeply influenced by Davidson as well. She internalized his teachings, wondering if her family's misfortunes were due to her lack of faith. As time passed, John began viewing Dina not as his partner, but as a vessel of evil spirits. Their relationship deteriorated, with John's dominance growing. It was evident that Dina was grappling with mental health issues. But Davidson's dangerous doctrine labeled mental illness as demonic possession and medicine as witchcraft. Deprived of genuine medical help, Dina's condition worsened. Church members' attempts to pray away her illness were futile. The family's life revolved around the church, attending services almost every day. Margaret, or Maggie, was born on January 9, 2004, at home with Dennis' midwife. Dinah had some postpartum with her other two daughters, but this time around was severely worse. Perhaps financial stresses coupled with her husband's cold demeanor contributed she attempted suicide by slitting her wrists. It wasn't until Dana was found wandering two miles from her home, screaming that characters on the television were laughing at her, that she got professional help. The police brought her in and she was admitted to a psychiatric hospital and diagnosed with postpartum psychosis. Deanna wanted to stay longer, but her husband John said he prayed about it and she needed to be home. CPS would monitor Dina for a few months, but being on her medication, she was doing much better. As soon as that was over, she would stop taking her medication because it was considered witchcraft. For months, Dina's psychosis became worse. She would make growling or missing noises, claim that Jesus was building an ark in her neighborhood, and even say that she wanted to give Maggie to Doyle Davidson to marry. She wanted Maggie to be with God. John believed that through prayer, Dina would get better. 
He continually hid Dina's behavior from doctors to keep her from taking medication or going back to the hospital. On November 22, 2004, Dana had been awake for several days obsessively reading the Bible. A verse popped out at her and read, If the right hand offends thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. In her head, she was convinced that God was calling for her and Maggie to go to heaven. So, without hesitation, she went to the kitchen to get a nine-inch butcher knife. With gospel music playing in the background, she started to cut baby Maggie's arms off. Screaming in extreme pain, Maggie had over 50 cuts on her face from the amputation. With both limbs now off, Maggie passed in agony, bleeding out in her crib. No child or human being deserved such a painful death, especially at the hands of her own mother. Dina then cut her own arm deeply and was trying to sever her arm off. However, John called and an emotionless Dina answered. She told John that she hurt Maggie. Instead of calling 911, John calls Doyle Davidson, of all people. Like the faithful servant he was, he did as Doyle told him to. He called Carolyn Thomas, one of Dina's friends at the daycare she used to work at. Carolyn, alarmed at what John had told her, immediately called Dana. A calm Dana answered and told Carloin that she had killed baby Maggie. The chilling event was discovered when Plano police responded to a 911 call made by Carloin. The 911 operator who took the call would later testify that they called Dana, and during their conversation, Schlosser confessed to the act. In the background, the gospel song, He Touched Me, eerily played. When the police arrived at the scene, they found Schlosser covered in blood, holding the knife, and singing Christian hymns. Interestingly, Schlosser had been under the radar of the Texas Child Protective Services earlier that year. However, after their investigation, they concluded that she posed no risk to her children. The tragic irony is that Margaret would lose her life the very next day after the incident, while Schlosser's other two daughters remained unharmed. During the subsequent trial, psychiatrist David Self provided testimony that shed light on Schlosser's mental state. She had shared with him that a television news story about a boy being mauled by a lion was interpreted by her as a sign of the impending apocalypse. She believed that God had commanded her to amputate her baby's arm and then her own. This act was later described as a religious frenzy. Dr. Self diagnosed Dina Schlosser with postpartum psychosis. Given the evidence and testimonies, Schlosser was found not guilty by reason of insanity. She was committed to the North Texas State Hospital with the condition that she would remain there until she was no longer deemed a threat to herself or others. In a twist of fate, she became roommates with Andrea Yates, another Texas woman infamous for drowning her five children believing it would protect them from Satan. During the court proceedings, it became evident that Dana was deprived of the essential medical assistance she desperately required. Her husband's religious beliefs prevented him from consistently purchasing her prescribed antipsychotic medications, which she had been on for years before Margaret's birth. Davidson, who was present at the trial, testified, asserting his belief that mental illnesses were the work of demons. He also mentioned that despite Dina and John being regular attendees of his church, he wasn't closely acquainted with them. However, phone records would indicate that was a lie. John had called Davidson multiple times on the day of the incident. The trial spotlight on Davidson's church led to the cancellation of his TV ministry. David Self concluded that Dana was suffering from postpartum psychosis, leading to a verdict of not guilty due to insanity. Following the incident, John underwent psychological assessment after their children were placed in foster care by CPS. He was identified to possess narcissistic tendencies and was criticized for not adequately safeguarding his children from Dina. CPS stipulated that John could only regain custody if his sister resided with him, a condition he accepted. Subsequently, John divorced Dina, ensuring she had no contact with him or their daughters. Dina's journey continued beyond confinement. She transitioned to outpatient care in November 2008, with conditions including weekly psychiatrist visits, consistent medication, 
and no unsupervised interactions with children. Yet, in April 2010, she was readmitted after being spotted wandering the streets at 2 a.m., displaying erratic behavior and loudly singing religious hymns. Sources indicate she was discharged in 2012 and took up employment at Walmart, only to be let go upon the discovery of her past. In 2012, a shopper at a Terrell Walmart recognized Schlosser, who was working as a cashier. This discovery led to public outrage, with many question. Walmart's decision to hire someone with such a notorious past. Walmart defended their decision, stating that all associates undergo a criminal background check. However, Schlosser, now going by the name Latner, was eventually let go from her position. Dina Schlosser's case is a tragic reminder of the severe impacts of postpartum psychosis. It underscores the importance of mental health awareness and the need for timely interventions. The incident also raises questions about societal rehabilitation and the challenges faced by individuals with a criminal past in reintegrating into society. What do you think about this case? Leave a comment below and as always, like and subscribe for more engaging true crime stories. Thanks for watching.